Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, Salesforce Marketing Cloud Dev Group and friends uh, for Generative AI Horizons Unleashing Digital Marketing's Future. Today, we've got um, we've got a host of a whole lot of friends sharing their stories and thoughts um, around Generative AI, uh, where it is now, where it's been to in the past, and where they see it in the future. Uh, it's a digital marketing group for developers, so there's going to be a, a slant towards what people are doing with um, Marketing Cloud, uh, and it's going to be a great learn. I'll let everyone introduce themselves as they get started. Um, there'll be Q&A at the end, like always, uh, and it should be really fun and interesting to find out what everyone's got to share. So I'll just advance the slides. So here's our fantastic group that are joining us today to share, uh, develop a group, uh, the purpose, together, learn, share, and mentor Salesforce Marketing Cloud. So I'm going to kick off because it just sort of makes sense, um, seeing that I'm talking and then hand over to Greg. So um, technology, oh, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Matt Cameron, um, and I'm a community group lead uh, with the Salesforce Marketing Cloud Dev Group. Uh, Got five talking points there. Technology is not magic, um, and AI is not magic either. My love of um, of AI has sort of come out, and it is a passion. I think it's sort of come out of my love of um, science fiction, and reading the early works of Isaac Asimov and A.C. Clarke, and try to understand. They didn't write about spaceships and all that sort of stuff. They they talked about people and trying to understand all the motivations for how they told their stories and what it meant for us uh, to be living um, with artificial intelligence or, or even artificial consciousness, which we're years away from yet, but I'm sure it'll be around the corner before too long. Um, I hope that nobody ever sees technology as magic. Um, it's always something that's there that we can make sense of. Takeaways about how I'm personally using AI. Then the title for this um, this presentation, this event, came out of um, GPT. Um, asked it to give us a nice, nice, nice groovy of it. No, and, and it's what it came up with: generative AI horizons unleashing digital marketing's future. So um, I'm asking it to help me, um, and I'll have content that I need to write in a deck, um, and I'll go and ask, what are some talking points? What are th some things that sort of make sense and help? Um, I'll never directly use it. Um, I've found that it, it helps me start to think about um, what I can do. Personally, um, I love music too. So another one of my passions is electric, electronic music. And I was doing a, I was playing some chords on the keyboard. I couldn't work out what should come next. So um, I, I put those chords in the chat GPT and it took me on a journey of what chords to do next. So um, I, I thought that was fun. And I, it was something that um, interacting with interacting with that um, machine intelligence um, to enhance what I was doing uh, was, was something I got a lot out of. Um, I've got a lot of pet social projects, to the point, uh, which I write about and um, currently researching a blog post called Unleashing Creative, Your Creative Potential, Harnessing Open Source Generative AI uh, with your own data for a, a trust-centric approach. I know trust is a big thing. How do we trust data? How do we, how do we, how do we, how do we work that out? And what are the things that make that make sense? So um, it's like a, a multi-layered onion. The more you dig into that one, <laughs> there's a lot of layers to it. So it's, it's something that's worth having a look at. Also, um, there's just so much happening out there. It's not Chat GPT, which came out of what um, Google the, the paper that they wrote about Transformers in 2017, like the GP and Bird Engines AI, it's it's also about understanding what we can do um, and build apps around the the layers of models, the, the models like ChatGPT that we've got. So um, forever doing that. One that I'm really keen on doing, yeah, I'm sort of conscious of time, maybe rambling a little bit, but is um, converting the content for... Um, the dev group, so it's easy to understand on our blog. Two books that I'm reading, always reading, recommend that you continue to read um, and, and look at reading. Two books I'm reading is AO 2041, 10 Versions of Our Future, 
um, and the AI marketing canvas right at the moment, but always reading. I'll share what I read on my blog. Um, for me, this moment's just so important because it just feels like it did when the internet started, um, but now we've got an opportunity for personalised communications with each other and sort of build it on that foundation. Uh, thanks for listening along. I hand over to Greg. All right, thank you, Matt. That was awesome stuff. Uh, I'm Greg Gifford. I am a current Salesforce MVP, uh, also known as Gore Tonington and Stack Exchange and on my blog. I uh, recently wrote um, Automating Salesforce Marketing Cloud with Jason Anshaw. Uh, very active in the community in a lot of different ways. Uh, so I wanted to start out actually a little bit different than, than I believe most most others are going. Instead of uh, talking about the future, I, I'm going to actually start in the past because although the future of AI is a huge topic, many people do not realize the rich and plentiful history behind AI, specifically generative AI. Like, did you know that generative AI goes back nearly nine decades? Uh, yep. <laughs> Generative AI had its start in the 1930s. Uh, I'm going to take a bit more of an educational approach on the discussion here rather than dive into like what I or my businesses personally are currently doing with AI. Uh, it all started with Alan Turing's compute, computable numbers. I always want to say computational, uh, <laughs> which laid the theoretical groundwork for computing, uh, which Obviously, without computing, you're not going to have AI. Uh, so at that combined with some early AI pioneers like uh, John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky, who then started exploring rule-based systems for generation of basic patterns and sequences. Now, we're going to skip ahead about 20 years into the 1950s, where Christopher uh, Sarchi developed a program called Baby. Uh, this is one of the earliest examples of generative AI. It was capable of generating simple melodies. Uh, this was, of course, very limited because of the capabilities of the time period. Now we're going to jump to the 1980s, where we witness a true boom in generative AI. Uh, research begins into potential of the neural networks, uh, which lead to more complex generative models, which then goes to 1990s, where we saw breakthrough after breakthrough in Gen AI. Uh, the introduction of recurrent neural networks, or RNN, uh, enabled machines to generate sequences of data, like text and music. Which then leads us into the early 2000s, when generative adversarial networks, GANs, emerged as a game changer. Uh, this revolutionized image generation and further enabled the creation of realistic and high quality images. Uh, then from there, we moved into 2010 and beyond where deep learning became a driving force behind generative AI uh, with the availability of large data sets and powerful GPUs. Uh, many remarkable milestones were passed. Uh, we witnessed the birth of generative models like variational autoencoders, VAEs, and transformer models. These led the models like these led to models like OpenAI's GPT-3, which most of us recognize as Chat GPT. Although they've now gone to the next, uh, I think there are two models above that now, uh, and further impressive AI systems. Uh, this then led to this to leads to discussions about the future of AI. Uh, as we now know the past, I'm going to dive in a bit about what I see the past leading us to for the future. Uh, the question everyone always wants to know is, where do you see digital marketing in five years after the introduction of AI? And to that, I, I always state, we're already there. In fact, we're well beyond that. AI has been around for a long time. Like look at Einstein, Grammarly, even Autocracked or Chatbox. All of those are a form of AI and they've been around for, for many years already. But of course, I'm, I'm not a jerk. So I'm going to answer the spirit of the question <laughs> that I see generative AI changing the workplace more along the lines of the skill sets people will need to know. Uh, not the, necessarily the number of people required. I don't see it reducing. I see it shifting. Uh, sure, 
you may lose like a couple copywriters along the way, but those copywriters can instead become content curators. They can become QA specialists, data validators, things like that, and just shift a related skill set that is now needed in order to make that copywriting ability of generative AI happen. So that's that's where I think a lot of a lot of the changes will be is along the lines of what we need to know to use the tool to allow it to enable us. So there's a million other necessary skill sets that will be needed in higher demand with generative AI taking a forefront. So yes, things like copywriting, development, and graphic design may be drastically changed in how they are created in the years to come, but I do not think it will be anything like the hype. It is not going to be like uh, iRobot or anything where we now have all these machines doing all of these tasks and, and we just are, are no longer needed for them. Like, I don't think that is something that we have anything to worry about. And I, I certainly don't think that we're going to get to where we are going to have that drastic change in five years. I think it might be closer to 10. Uh, and, and that's based off of the amount of risk involved up front right now with the unknown consequences, with the unintentional consequences and all of the unknowns and how fast and how far things are going right now. I think there's going to be a lot of plateaus and a lot of tripping going on over the next couple of years that everyone's going to learn from and it's going to get better, but there's going to be mistakes. Like for instance, uh, my favorite one to point to whenever I talk about uh, Gen AI is Tay from Microsoft back, uh, I think, 2012, 20, so, something along those lines. It was basically a Twitter bot that within 16 hours was spewing out very politically incorrect and racist things unintentionally because the Twitter audience was feeding it. Uh, this information and turned it into to a terrible thing that was very quickly then disconnected and removed. So I don't I see a lot of that coming up, and I think that through that there's going to be a lot of shifts and moves to to take it. And I mean, it could also turn into something like we saw with NFT or IoT, the Internet of Things, where it's huge for a couple of years and, and then it's gone. I mean. <laughs> honestly nft the only major thing it gave me was that it taught me that fungible is a word <laughs> so on that i'm gonna to pass it through that's that's my my ted talk right so thank you um i work uh, at study group um it's an organization based in the uk and i'm responsible for driving crm strategy across uh, 30 university brands in the uk us australia and new zealand um so uh, i guess the way that we're using AI at the moment is, is probably twofold. Um, as Greg kind of alluded to, AI has been around for quite some time now. Um, and um, we have been using it within Salesforce Marketing Cloud, like I suspect a number of people have been for a number of years uh, through Einstein. So whether that be send time optimization, free frequency and recency scoring, engagement scoring, all those lovely bits of functionality that help us essentially segment subscribers within within journey builder so we've been using it in that way for a couple of years now and continue to you know go up on that that maturity curve in in terms of the use cases that we're deploying but i think what we've focused on over the past three to six months in particular is uh gpt and, and other um, ai tools have, have become more prevalent on the market is um, we've we've um uh, subscribe to a, a tool called copy.ai, um, which is essentially leveraging GPT-4 in the background. And we're using that to generate um, basic email copy at the moment. So predominantly that's in the space of um, sales messages, sales emails, one-to-one -one emails, and some of our more brand agnostic, multi-brand emails and SMS uh, campaigns um, that form part of our kind of nurture journey and uh, standalone campaigns. We are also using it as well for basic uh, SQL and AmScript um, uh, code as well, but that, that's really basic. And I think, you know, the old, old caution around not throwing into the mix to any of these third parties, 
PII data or any data that you, you really don't want um, out there in the public domain is, is a really important one. We're also starting to experiment with some of their um, newer uh, pieces of functionality where you can essentially create individual brand voices. Uh, and that's really important in my industry where we are managing uh, multiple brands to be able to tailor the tone of voice of, of copy per brand. Um, so that's something where we're also starting to experiment with as well. Um, but I think our key learning up until this point is that it's really at this stage, not a replacement for good copywriting um, that isn't time bound. So this is more in the domain of, hey, we need to get this email out tomorrow which is not good planning anyway, but we've got to do it. Um, how do we kind of get copy up as quickly as possible and then apply a QA process to that copy in the same way we would uh, for any human generated copy as well. So I, th I think that's, that's key. I've got a few tips down there um, that I'll go through, but I think the first one, the primary one I'd just say is just jump in and give it a go. When we did it, we didn't know what to expect. And it took a while for us to kind of get into a rhythm where we were uh, feeling a bit of confidence in, in the copy that was uh, coming out. And that was really based on needing to provide good prompts. So I think, you know, briefing and, and, and prompting, it's an art form, just as is any marketer um, delivering a good creative or, or content brief into an agency or a creative services team. It takes time to put... Um, that effort into actually creating good brief and it shouldn't be any different when you're creating those prompts to generate uh, good output from from AI and um, we also did a bit of experimenting as well so testing AI generated co copy versus human generated copy to be honest the results were, were marginal in, in terms of what performed better um, but it was still certainly interesting to to, to look at and I think um, I guess you know, down to my hope for the future. Um, I think really AI being grounded in trust and ethics is, is really important. Uh, I know Salesforce, obviously, you know, going to the past few events that they've done in the UK, it's really interesting that they're starting to step up and, and look to own that space around trust and the ethical use of AI. You see it in their product demos, you see them emphasizing the trust layer, hopefully, you know, that comes to fruition and, and it's more than just words, it's actions speak louder than words. And I think from, from the company standpoint, adopting AI um, companies, we need to do that ethically, mindful of the potential future displacement of people um, and the need to really invest in upskilling the workforce of anyone that, that is, you know, even slightly impacted by that. You know, you can be impacted just by not being able to do a good prompt. Um, so, you know, focus on delivering the enabling training and, and skill sets to actually make, make the best use of AI. It's not about replacing jobs, um, but, you know, we need to, we need to really focus on how we, we leverage it um, you know, to our advantage. And I, I guess the, the final note from me, you know, we're using a third party platform. I'm really looking forward to as soon as um, I can pull the business case together and get the proper investment to start to look at how we embed AI into our common workflows, productivity, um, processes, et cetera. So using in-house Salesforce AI rather than third-party bolt-ons that aren't really integrated and, and don't really have the connection into our data, so therefore don't have the context. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, James, so much for sharing. Leslie, are you there? Uh, sure am. Awesome. All right. So um, I am starting off with a little bit of a quote, which I will read to you, even though it's right in front of you and you could probably read it yourself. Um, from the book, uh, The Magic of Thinking Big, which is that the story is told that the great scientist Einstein was once asked how many feet are in a mile. Einstein's reply was, I don't know. Why should I fill my brain with facts I can find in two minutes in any standard reference book? So who knows if he actually said that. I know there's a lot of quotes out there that are misattributed, but uh, concept remains the same. Um, for me, my use of AI so far has mostly been outsourcing my brain, I guess I would say, um, not wasting my time or brain space with things that, uh, that 
AI could do. Um, so repetitive actions, et cetera, uh, much like a calculator or you know, much more efficient use of Google. Um, so for example, um, I will, you know, take a chunk of code that's not cooperating and dump it into ChatGPT and say, where is my syntax error? Um, and usually it'll find a comma or a semicolon that I've missed, right? So instead of spending hours looking for what I screwed up, um, the other thing I love using it for is speeding up things I've done in the past that I just don't really want to think through again, like a loop within a loop within a loop um, in an AMP script. Uh, script, you know, something I know I can do. I've done it before. I know what questions to ask. I just don't really want to think through the logic again, right? Um, but it's not perfect. So I've actually been working on one of these loops within a loop within a loop the last couple of days and chat GBT and I've been fighting about, uh, um, initializing variables, right? So chat GBT says you need to initialize a variable in AMP script with set variable equals, and then like a semicolon, which of course is not true. You can just list the variable. So, Anyway, um, so on that note, there are a couple other AI tools besides ChatGPT that I've been using a lot lately. GitHub Copilot is fantastic. Um, it does really well with AMP script. It will auto-populate what it thinks you're gonna write next. And it does a very good job of guessing what I wanna write next. Um, so really good example of this is the very tedious task of any time in AMP script that you retrieve a row set, whether that's a lookup or you're retrieving from Salesforce, the next thing that needs to happen is, you know, to iterate through the rows. So it's almost always followed with a for loop. Um, and uh, GitHub Copilot will just spit the loop out. <laughs> so you don't have to go through you know, the retrieve the row, retrieve the field, retrieve whatever. Um, it'll also auto populate all the variables for you if you do want to initialize variables without having to go through your code and like identify every variable. Um, and then the other fun AI tool that I've been using a lot is goblin.tools. That's literally the website. If you type goblin.tools into your URL, it has several things. Um, I know a lot of the, a lot of uh, the women in email group in our email geek Slack channel have used, uh, there is a tone uh, judge <laughs> tool. So if someone writes you an email that you think is kind of a nasty email, you can dump the text into the judge and it'll tell you if you're taking it too personally <laughs> or if it really is kind of a nasty email. I don't, I haven't used that at all, but the two things I do use, um, it has a magic to do where you will just natural language, type something in like um, build a cloud page with an HTML form that does X, Y, and Z, hit a little magic tool and it'll break down all this, it'll give you all the steps all the way down to like open a browser, um, which sounds really corny, but you know, sometimes when you don't wanna start a big project, having a to-do list item that says, open a web browser is a really, is a really good way to get the ball rolling. Um, and then the estimator, which is, uh, you type in any task, natural language, and it'll tell you about how long it thinks it's going to take you to, to get done. So it'll say, you know, one to two weeks, two to four weeks. Uh, that's really nice when you're trying to scope out a project or I have terrible estimation skills. So some, someone will say to me, how long will it take you to do this? And I'll say probably three hours and I'll have it done in two days. And I'm, there's no, I'm completely wrong. Right. So it's like honest with me. Um, so my big takeaway for the future is, uh, and I was going to call out Cameron directly, but he's after me. So, <laughs> so I'm just going to give you a preview, um, of his comments about how, you know, about being aware of the upcoming youth who are learning how to use AI. Um, I feel like when I have these arguments with ChatGPT about whether or not you need to initialize a variable or 
why is this crashing? Oh, it's because there's an extra semicolon on the beginning of a string. Um, if I haven't, if I hadn't suffered writing my own code for several years, would I know how to troubleshoot what it's spitting back at me? So while I do think that, you know, we have to like really adapt to the changes, I also, I'm concerned that if we lean on AI too much um, and we don't develop interns, entry-level positions, um, and if the current high school generation alpha doesn't learn how to suffer by writing their own code, are they going to know how to um, argue back with the robots or <laughs> to uh, troubleshoot the errors, you know, what, like what, how are they going to, um, I guess, keep the reins on AI without any foundational knowledge. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leslie. Cameron, and I can see this slide is going to um, unfold. I, I thought I would try your pre-coffee brain in the morning. Uh, I thought <laughs> I'd uh, put you through the paces and see how we go. So yes, I did have to uh, put some clicks into mine, sorry, just because I got a, a bit of content to show, but I will speed through it. So thank you so much. I'll get you to do the first click and so we'll get started. So hi, Cam, I do marketing cloud things. Uh, and my first tip as we go through some AI conversation is what you can see here. It's just get over your adoption resistance. You know, people didn't get into iTunes for a while. It took a while for even me to get into Steam games. You know, people get these resistances to try new things because they're just so used to the old way of doing things. Get over the resistance. Uh, there's a colleague of mine on the call who you'll hear from shortly who actually helped me and inspired me to get over my resistance. It took a good conversation and a beer to do it, but he inspired me to look more into this stuff and realized that this chat GPT thing wasn't just to help me write my you know, two-year-old birthday uh, invitation for my son in the tone of a pirate. It wasn't there to do that. It was actually so much more. So my first piece of, uh, of a takeaway tip for the group listening here today is just get in and give it a go. There are these great tools out there. ChatGPT is free, right? You can jump in with your Google login and try things out for yourself and learn what prompting is. Prompting is that way of searching. It's a way of getting what you need from ChatGPT to, to come back to you. And um, you can see there on the screen, the other one you can use is MidJourney. Uh, it's a cheap one. Um, it doesn't cost too much to, to try. I think that free one's been taken away for the moment. But MidJourney is the image version. Uh, effectively, you can prompt things to images. Now, I actually gave it some prompts, and I gave it the prompt of a uh, photography portrait of a typical Salesforce marketing solution architect and a typical Salesforce marketing cloud email specialist. Now, first of all, these images are riddled with biases, but can you almost pick out which one's which? Which one's the architect and which one's the specialist? Curious, right? Anyway, I'll get back to this one later, but get into ChatGPT, get into these GPT models because they are riddled with biases. And if you go in with your eyes closed, you're trying to do this for production in your business, trying to generate emails and things, you're going to be ignoring those biases. But by getting in, getting your hands dirty and trying things out, just experimenting, don't do things for business, do things for yourself, just play around. You'll begin to learn how these biases work. And you can actually then learn how to get around the biases and how to prompt against them to reduce their impact on your outputs. So get in, have a go, have a play. There's free things out there. Again, you've heard some great tools already from the rest of the group, but there are some great free ones out there just to try for yourself. Next click, if you wouldn't mind, Matt, is my next tip. Now, I love the, the quote, how to Google. For many years now, I'm pretty sure that we've used that as a bit of a soft skill <laughs> when we interview. Uh, I know how to Google, which is pretty important right, for what we do. Because just like Leslie said, I don't want to have to spend all my time trying to you know, fill my brain with information that I don't need. Fantastic quote, by the way. I don't. I couldn't sit here and tell you right now every single ordinal of every single script function. I can't do that. I'm sure Elliot could, but I can't. Um, I refer to documents because I need to. I've got other things I want to think about. But what if someone hasn't answered the question that I want to ask? That's the curious thing about Google. Google's just a, a pointing post. It sends you to content that another human has sat down and written. And it's just pointing you to that content. But what if the question I've got hasn't really been answered directly by any human in existence yet? That's where GPT comes in. 
You see, it's a language model. So it already has the information of the internet, which they've already got some things going on for, but they've already got the language of the internet already down in one place. And so when you ask it questions in the right structured prompt way, it's gonna generate answers that don't exist. So rather than Googling to get someone else's handwritten text that they committed to a GitHub or to a Medium post or something, when I type into ChatGPT or similar tools, I'm getting something original. Now, just like Leslie said, you do have to have the, the knowledge to know what's accurate and what's not, but it's still gonna be new. And if I'm trying to solve a very particular problem, like Leslie said, a for loop in a for loop, then that probably doesn't exist on the internet how I want it. But if I prompt it just right, I'll get the results that I want. So it's really important to understand that having a skill, knowing how to GPT and knowing how to interact with these models is gonna be as important, if not more, than knowing how to Google is in your day job today. And that's a skill that you have to spend time on tools learning how to grow. So spend time and play with it. Last tip here is learn how to use these tools as a resource. They are not a be all end all end point, right? AI is not, uh, again, I'm gonna keep picking on some quotes. It's not the iRobot level of stuff here. What we're seeing right now in the current generation of AI, even as Greg said, it's been an iterative growth over the decades and we are not at its final form. We are not there yet. So use the tools we've got now as a resource. Googling things, using Stack Exchange as a resource, right? But even if you look at the stats, Stack Exchange's uh, page hits have been declining. That resource is becoming less valuable. It's less sharp. There's this new resource out there now that's more valuable to developers because they can generate their own code based on really good prompts. So don't treat ChatGPT or AI or these other tools, don't treat them as this one thing that's a silver bullet that's gonna fix all your problems. It's not, it's, we're not there yet. But what it is though, it is a faster means to an end. It's gonna help you get to the goals that you want. Now, the trick is gonna be interfacing with that tool to get to where you want to go. Just like when you have colleagues who are not quite sure how to Google and you have to teach them how to put the right keywords in the right structure to get the right results they want on the first page. Same thing with these GPT tools. If you understand how those prompts are structured, how to interface with them, you can use it as a resource to answer your questions, to uh, time save, and that's the big thing here. Uh, as my quote above, you will be replaced by someone who can use AI before AI replaces you. There is no robot that's gonna replace my skill set, but someone who can use AI to do my job faster than me will replace me. They'll be more efficient. They can do more in less time. Great example, for those who've been following my SQL in Marketing Cloud uh, videos, all the data that's in those sample tables, I had sat down late one night and tried to type out a whole lot of random authors and customer names and book names. And I thought to myself, why am I sitting here inventing book names and blurbs and descriptions? And I threw it into ChatGPT. And within seconds, I had hundreds of rows of sample data, which I could then load into a data extension to use for this SQL piece. So it can save enormous amounts of time. It can change the way your day entirely flows if you can use it as a resource. So spend some time, learn how it works and turn these tools into a resource. You can hear some more great things from the, the guys coming up. So I'll relinquish the microphone to them. But any questions on this stuff as well, feel free to reach out to the group. Um, there's some great topics here. I'm very, very happy to help others show how I got on my path with AI and what I'm up to so far. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks, Cam. Hello. Hello, can you hear me okay? We certainly can. Awesome. All right, I'm saving some bandwidth, so I'm not gonna share my video, but I look like the picture, except that I'm not uh, black and white. Um, so yeah, my name is Pato Sapir. I like cameras intro. I do marketing cloud things. And I wanted to, my thoughts on generative AI have to do more about, uh, the concept of inclusive and explainable AI. So I'm going to be very brief, but I have three, three questions that I feel everyone should ask themselves as they are integrating this new technology and using platforms that use, uh, you know, large language models. The first one is, uh, you know, your data set. As you are feeding information to a, to a large language model, are you considering, is your data set inclusive enough? Is, are you incorporating, um, you know, data that represents a diverse universe of, of people from different ethnicities and whatnot? You know, because the results are going to be as good as the information you are feeding the, the system. And as also with prompting, 
you know, there is a concept of association bias, you know, are you prompting, um, you know, the system with a bias, for example, that an example of a association bias could be assuming that all pilots are male and flight attendants are female, you know, so again, as you provide prompts to to um, something like chat GPT, the results can also, you know, if, you're, if your prompt is biased, your results are going to be biased as well. The second point has to do with um, fact checking and explainable AI. You know, can you interpret the results that you were given? Can you actually fact check? You know, if you're asking, um, you know, to provide resources, you know, to, to give recommendations, are you fact checking those results? And the third one has to do with uh, privacy. You know, I think the topic of privacy rights um, is still very green when it comes to generative AI, but it's very important that you continue to respect your customers' privacy uh, choices and also that, you know, be very careful of what information uh, you put into this system, especially if it, if it is a third party, um, you know, system that, that is generating data for you. Uh, but also consider when you are presenting information to your customers, whether it's a website, an email, are you taking into account their choice of, of you know, how you want to communicate with them and, and in what tone? Uh, so those are, you know, pretty much my, my thoughts. Um, I am going to present uh, in Dreamforce this year in the topic of uh, generative AI. I, I am going to cover about... 10 to 15 different tools that you can utilize today um, outside of what's available from Salesforce to supercharge your day-to-day -day as an admin developer or marketer. Um, so if you are going to attend Dreamforce, it'll be great to see you there. Uh, and I'm gonna cover some of these topics um, as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Dee, are you with us? Hello, I am. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, group. Um, so a lot has been covered of generative AI. I think we all get the gist. Oh, first, let me introduce myself. Dee Sirico, um, I am the marketing solutions specialist for an agency called Primacy. So a lot of what people have spoken about is I deal with customers' instances. Um, so I really focus on the security side of things. Um, and this is you know, a couple of the talking points that I have, I think we covered, you know, how are we using generative AI now? See the, you know, all of the data that's crunching and giving you, you know, analysis, which probably took us hours and hours before, uh, but like a few others have said, what you're doing before you know how to actually monitor it or put it into a chat GBT. Um, so I have many clients who will not allow us to use Einstein and um, going back to some of the, you know, previous conversations as well, you know, it's going to be quite a few years, I believe, before the red tape is cleared, legal clears, you know, AI to really be used at its full force. So I know there's a lot of discussion of jobs being lost, but right now I think we're, especially right now in this group and in our space, we're at a really good point in time where we can help develop what the future will look like you know uh, what we don't want to do is you know discourage people from learning um, so like just piggybacking off of a lot of the conversation is that we definitely do need to know how to, to how to code what AMP script we need what the emails how the email should function where all of this information lives in the system you know, I would love to put some things into chat GBT, but I can't uh, for security protocol reasons. So um, eventually, like what I would like to see um, in the next five years is, you know, I would like to be able to talk to text, honestly, to Salesforce Marketing Cloud and say, hey, please reference this SQL, rewrite it for uh, this variable and, you know, show me what you have. I audit it, boom, we have, a you know, a new set of SQL. Um, I would like to be able to, you know, get to a point where where we can do that uh, with certain verification. So hopefully that happens. Um, you know, again, I focus a lot on the security side of things. So, oh, I missed one. Um, real time content personalization. We have it, um, and we have competitors in the Salesforce Marketing Cloud space 
I won't say names, but you know, they've been acquired by other companies that that artists use to, you know, create the content. Why can't we make that connection of just being in one platform, connecting it, deliver the content in real time based off of that library? Instances like that where, you know, we can teach the systems what we think, what we want, and what the behavior analytics and uh, data system. delivery so that will get a lot better. better. Um, again, you know, these are things we're going to have to teach it. It's not, you know, AI is, AI is not going to teach itself. Um, I would also like to see, I think in the next five years, we'll have a better handle on cybersecurity within the platform. So we have Marketing Cloud and we have third-party systems integrating, but they're still attacks. So if we can be and train and build AI to you know, be proactive in the cybersecurity world. I feel that that could uh, cause a lot of a lot of uh, endless hours and days by fighting bots coming in through forms that you know just aren't being blocked by whatever cloud page or uh, instance, not even cloud pages, but websites, website forms that are integrated. So I think that'll happen in the next five years that we really get a handle on the cyber. Um, again, you know, the bots entering our system, and I think we're at a good spot, you know, where personally we're, we're just cutting out of a pandemic, right? I think one of the reasons that probably all of us work so well is because at one point in our, in our lives, we've worked in offices with other people. And so that's the same thing with building AI. Like if we don't know the infrastructure of what we're trying to do or accomplish or how to, or even like the social cues, how to work with people and, you know, instead of maybe handing over documentation to another developer, we're inputting it into chat GBT to build that repertoire, to build that, you know, um, the learnings, the learning curve, you know, advancing its learning with us. Um, you know, we just have to stick with it. I feel like we will definitely need to keep our eyes on monitoring what it does, uh, especially because of the fact that there's so much, you know, cyber issues happening right now. So that's where I'm a little apprehensive. Um, overall, I think it's, um, but yeah, I'm excited to see some of the Dreamforce presentations and thank you. Thank you so much, Day. Aaron. Yes, hello, I'm okay. here. And I, and I put clicks in there for you, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, but thank you. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Aaron Beatty and I'm the CEO of Engage Evolution and 2023 Salesforce Marketing Cloud Champion. And I've been in the space for more than 10 years. Um, I also will be at Salesforce, so love to meet up there. Um, so first off, I wanna call your attention to four tools that we use at Engage Evolution. We use Fathom, Superpower GPT, Auto GPT, and MidJourney. Fathom is an AI meeting assistant that transcribes, records, highlights, and summarizes meetings in real time. It's free and it's pretty great. Uh, Superpower GPT is a plugin for ChatGPT that gives you a ton of options on top of ChatGPT. It just makes them easily accessible. Um, also wanted to add that with ChatGPT4, I was recently able to compile an entire iOS, iPad, and Mac app in Swift without handwriting a single line of code. And that's a programming language that I do not know. Um, and all I did was act as the interface between ChatGPT and the compiler errors. And I would just feed them back and forth between the, the, uh, between the other. As soon as there's something that lets them speak to each other, there's no need for me to even be involved other than to give my vision. Um, AutoGPT, I think you can click again here. Let's see where we're at in the this, this slides here. Okay, we'll get to that in just a second. That's fine though. Um, AutoGPT is a command line interface that takes a goal, it breaks it down into steps, and then it chains together thoughts to achieve that goal. So as an example, I asked it to find the perfect present for my mom for her birthday. I gave it a budget of $100. It researched her, it researched the entire internet, and ultimately it purchased a $30 lavender spa basket from Amazon, which she loved. And she said, how did you know I love lavender so much? So that's all <laughs> That's all available with AutoGPT and ChatGPT. Um, MidJourney was mentioned earlier. It's a great AI image creation bot. It can create images or share anything in any style. 
I will share my favorite one with you all in one of the last Matt Cameron clicks uh, at the end of my presentation. Um, so my tips for using ChatGPT is number one, change the tone, especially if you're using it uh, for any kind of you know customer facing outbound stuff, you can change it to whatever you want. You can have it, give it to you in, in Snoop Dogg's voice or whatever you want. Uh, you also can ask it to provide its responses in Markdown, which is super nice. And I think the most important tip is to tell it to ask you questions until it understands enough of the background to answer the question at hand. Um, last, last, or one of the last clicks on where this is going, um, my goal in Marketing Cloud and our goal, I think, for everyone has been to personalize the customer experience through communication. And we've only really partially been able to get there. So if you imagine the work it takes to create one email with one segment, and then you imagine maybe you want something personalized for five audience segments, your workload probably just increased at least fivefold. And with the advancing state of AI, I mean, we already have tools that can sit on top of our data warehouses like Snowflake and can understand not only the implicit connections within that data, but they can also begin to understand the implied connections and the patterns that we weren't even aware of. So that AI can then find any segment or group just by asking. And that's mostly available today in some of these other tools. And that's without writing a line of SQL or with, without script activities or anything. And so if you imagine that that same AI is then fed with models built on psychology and buyer intent and marketing tactics, and now the AI knows not only what a welcome email looks like, but it also knows you. It knows your purchase history, your browsing habits, your email viewing habits, your SMS info, and it knows what makes you tick and your, you know, your preferred marketing channels and all that. So if we give this AI the goal of maximizing profits, it's then going to be able to analyze what's in stock, look at profit margins, seasonal trends, audience data, and it's going to know exactly what buttons to press for each person at exactly the right time. And then it can craft just the right message for that person too which ultimately would mean that all of the programming behind the scenes of an ESP wouldn't really be necessary or even the interface of that ESP. Uh, so with that capability, the only thing that AI really needs is the cheapest API driven outbound communication channels possible, something like Amazon SES or something like that, where it can just send out and say, send this message to this person at this time. It wouldn't even need to necessarily be an automation or a drip or a journey or anything like that. So my hope is that by that point, we all have our own personal AI assistants that can properly block and screen out these AI marketing messages because they're going to be too effective without the proper safeguards in place. So I hope that at least the first few versions of that personal AI will allow me to enjoy a glass of, you know, maker's mark without getting an electric shock and without alerting my doctor, my wife, Walgreens and my insurance company. And uh, that's the end of my take. I'm not sure if Robin is next or if we're going to send it off to someone else. <laughs> that's uh, well, not my, that's not here. One more click. And then you'll have my, my favorite uh, image from mid journey. There you I go. Think, oh man. Yeah. It's just up there for a second, but you got it. <laughs> well, um, Robert. Oh, I'll yes. jump in. Um, thanks so much. So Robin Foster here. I work for Salesforce. So I've been uh, on the other end trying to understand what's coming and trying to help prepare the customers we work with for the, the future that we've all been discussing today and, and trying to make sure that where there is questions around, you know, what's coming and what's possible and how is this going to change my business? How is this going to change the people I, the lives of the people I employ? All of those things are sort of questions that we're discussing day to day in all of these new uh, meetings that we're having. And uh, so I thought before we really dive into those conversations, I wanted to just speak to my own experience with AI. And uh, I think Cameron gave me a, a nice shout out earlier. I think I've been gushing about AI from the moment that I first saw ChatGPT and, and realized that I was dealing with something that could write better than most of the people I went to university with it really started to make me realize that there is a change coming. And as I started to look around, I realized that most of the people in my network didn't really understand the gravity of the situation. And so since then, it's been a bit, a bit of an evangelistic journey, trying to make sure that people aren't just hearing AI and their eyes gloss over as, as it seems to be a pretty common buzzword over the last decade. But uh, this is definitely <clears throat> a new flavor of AI. 
and uh, it will change the way we deal with technology and the way we deal with data. Um, in my own use cases, I obviously am uh, presenting a lot. So every day I'm talking to customers, I'm trying to tell stories in their business with their context in mind. And so I'm using ChatGPT to, to write emails every day. I don't think I've handwritten email copy in close to six months. And uh, I have yet to be called up by, uh, by a prospect to say that there was something that was uh, not quite right or didn't quite fit the bill. Uh, it's always passed the, the inspection test. And uh, in that regard, I've been very happy with, with sort of what it's able to do in a, in a corporate setting. Obviously, we still have to worry about hallucinations and, and the prompt giving us uh, incorrect results. And, and to echo a lot of what other people have said, it really is important to have somebody that's competent, that knows what they're doing in the driving seat, even if the AI is doing the bulk of the work. I think of it much more as a, as a manager with a team where you know, we now become a manager orchestrating our, our AI army, for lack of a better word, where it's like you still need somebody with a competence to make the to, to call the shots, but once you've called the shots, you, you know that it will be able to carry it out to your specifications. So on top of that, Mid Journey, fantastic. If you haven't played with this today, just go do that. It's like learning that you can draw without any skills. It's um it's really amazing. Um, and then GitHub Copilot for for any coding use cases genuinely has made coding so much more fun for me. Not having to to look up the, the simple syntax for every new language that I, that I play around with um, in the IDE. Now I've got two icons here with Zapier and Notion. I think these two here are one of my new pet projects, but I've been working with uh, ChatGPT, especially with ChatGPT4 and the plugins that are available with that solution where you can actually have ChatGPT integrate into any of your downstream solutions based on the conversations you're having with it. So at the moment, I'm working with it to create new records and to even update existing records inside of my Notion database. So if I have a new to-do list or a new task I wanna do, I can simply ask ChatGPT, hey, I've got a new task, can you write it, write it for me? And it will automatically fill in all the fields for Notion and create that entry for me in that system. And I think it's a, it's a good proof of concept around you know, our ability in the future to be able to work with a conversational bot, for lack of a better word, and yet have all of our admin being done for us in the back end, all of these little changes being done on our behalf, because we have given it the context, because we've had that conversation, we've now just got an executive assistant that's helping us execute on what we've been sort of discussing. So on to uh, what we're hearing in the industry. I think this is important because it kind of highlights where most of our customers are at and most of the people that we're working with, our end consumer that we're trying to help with our marketing solutions. In this case, we, we're hearing a lot about um, customers who have this massive repository of data. And it may be that although 90% of that data comes from pretty discrete sources, we know exactly the data around you know, what they've been purchasing, their purchase history, how long they've been a member and those kind of things. What we don't really know is, is some of that um, things we need some creativity for and some, some human logic where we're able to look at all of that data across all of those fields and, and sort of begin to build a picture of each of those records and, and what each of them might be looking forward to, might be interested in. With AI, we, we have the ability to effectively put a, a quasi-human um, I guess, summary of the entire record against every account, whether that's sort of the, the type of general persona they fit in, whether it's they are a, um, a customer that seems to be friendly and engaging well with us or somebody that seems resistant to, to communicating with us. Trying to pull all of that kind of information out of each record would take a human a lot of time, especially at scale when a lot of our customers are working at, you know, 100,000 to you know, 10 million records how are, we, how are we doing that kind of um, data manipulation at scale without relying on some tools like, like these to, to help us take our data from, from what we have today to the next level and then being able to use some of that generated fields to change the way we have conversations with, with our customers. And uh, I think on the right here, we've got a, a picture of, of some of what I, what I mean when 
we can start to really bring in this um, this data into the way we communicate. We, we at Salesforce are obviously very um, hard at work to try and bring this to life where we can use some of that data that we've just discussed to help enrich the copy to make sure it's more contextual and more relevant for each individual who is receiving it. And I think we can see here where somebody, for example, has been to uh, connections before versus a new connections attendee, we're subtly able to change the way that we communicate based on all of that data that we already have to, to ensure that we're building deeper engagement. So we, we've got a lot coming down the, the pipe. And uh, I think the, the rest of those questions really speak to where we're thinking and where we're looking to, to bring value. But uh, the last one around prompting is where I think uh, a lot of lay people in the industry are really looking for um, guidance, where we've talked a lot today about prompt engineering and the need to have somebody who knows what they're doing in the driving seat when we're, we come to authoring prompts. I think once we have prompts that we trust and that we've tested in the business and that we've had several people, you know, really put them through their paces, we need to be able to take those prompts and deliver them to the rest of the business. We need to be able to give the new marketer that started on Tuesday, the ability to write the same level of copy as somebody who's been here for three years. And the only way we do that is by, by scaling these prompts out and delivering them right to the, the place where people are writing. So for us, that's trying to make sure that when we're creating email copy, we have the ability to have access to these winning um, prompts right there. When it comes to writing subject lines, we want to make sure that that's there. In, in time to come, we're, we're looking forward to things like um, generative AI generated segments. So doing auto segmentation based on uh, the data you have around each of your segments currently in your, your business, as well as things like campaign generation and full, hopefully full journey generation in time to come as well. So uh, although very exciting and early days, I think in a year's time, we all reconvene to discuss what's happened. I think we'll all still be just as um, genuinely impressed with, with the amount of innovation that's, that's still to come in this space. And uh, that's all from me. Thank you so much, Robin. Hi, Jenna. Hi, sorry for being late. Uh, clients come first, you guys all know how that goes. Um, <laughs> so thank you guys for letting me jump in at the last minute. And I'm gonna skip over a lot of this because I know a lot of this was already covered. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure Greg Gifford spoke for both of us predominantly and Leslie, I know had some, had covered all my ideas around using uh, AI to help you rubber duck and everything else. Um, so, uh, first off, I just want to say, you know, um, you know, going, don't get intimidated by AI. It's only an algorithm. Um, you know, back to what Robin was talking about with the data modeling and stuff. That's, that's not very new. It's, it's been around for a long time. Um, we've been building lead scoring models and algorithms to score our data for a very long time. I've built several myself and lots of people on this call have too. <laughs> so, um, don't get intimidated by it, use it, you know, and let it help you. Um, let it help um, our entry date, our, our people that are just entering in. Um, don't let it intimidate them. So back to what Robin's saying, let it empower them. <laughs> um, so, um, and let it empower not only entry level people and people that are just learning like Dee was talking about and don't be, don't be scared of getting in there and just, just trying it. Um, you don't need to be an expert prompt engineer in order to write the perfect prompt. In fact, ask the AI what prompt to feed it. You'll be surprised. It will really help you generate um, more specific prompts for your, um, for your solutions uh, that you're trying to use it for. Um, but myself, I'm, I'm actually dyslexic and um, I have ADHD as well. So I'm on the spectrum. And, um, <laughs> but dyslexia um, has been a huge, um, it's really blocked me and really, and I'm just now talking about it. Sorry guys, I need to turn this off. Um, but um, it's really held me back in my career and I'm using AI to help um, set me free a little bit and, and push me forward and, and help empower me. Um, I hate writing. Anybody that has ever, worked with me and um greg can tell you this specifically um 
I, I will ask someone else to write a, a single sentence on my behalf because uh, writing is, is such a traumatic experience for me with my dyslexia. Um, I am now writing on my own without screaming or throwing a temper tantrum or hissing or a hissy fit or having a, a pure breakdown uh, before I write because I'm using chat GPT to help me. I'm going in there and saying, I need a paragraph and I wanna say this, but don't know the words or I'm worried about rambling on and I'm worried about my grammar, you know, <laughs> and, and all this other stuff or, or presenting perfect that first time. Um, it's really helping me. It's really, it's really helping me overcome that hurdle and overcome that fear. So don't, don't be afraid of it. Use it, let it empower you and um, let it help you um, succeed in your career and um, tell everybody that has accessibility issues, you know, it's, it's your friend, man, it can really help you and, you know, build confidence in yourself and, and your skill set. So, um, and then try them all. There's a bunch of them out there. And, and I have a bunch of logos here. Um, and I think a few got dropped off, but yeah, um, try them all. Um, uh, a fun one is is llama um it it does have a bar to entry it is more of a developer friendly um tool but um but that's a, that's a fun one and it's a facebook app so it's a it's more broadly used across the world um but yeah so check them all out um don't be afraid of them and then five years I don't think we're going to get that far in five years. Um, <laughs> I'm with Greg. Um, once again, uh, Greg's probably said everything that I need to say, so I'm going to be real fast. Um, I don't think we're going to get that far. This has been around for a long, long time. We've been using this technology for a long, long time. I can list all the different AI techs that you're using that you probably didn't even think about it being AI. If there's an algorithm behind it, technically it's AI. It might not be one of these fancy new neural networks that we have, which are fantastic go play with them google has a bunch of open ones that you can create your own neural networks um but um you know i don't think we're going to get that far and the reason i don't get, think we're going to get that far is because we've had 90 years of history so far it, it, we haven't gotten that far and people are fearful people are fearful for for what they don't understand and there's the majority of of humans don't understand this so there's going to be a lot of pushback against the use of this um secondly there's a lot of bias um and when i say bias i mean we are innately biased we are humans and we create these we feed these algorithms so guess what until we figure out how to stop being biased and if you ever look at how many biases there are out there there's millions okay if you think you're not biased honey you're biased i don't care what you say so <laughs> Remember, we feed these algorithms, we create these algorithms, we tell them what to learn and where to learn and where to go look. Um, they're as smart as we are. And nobody has a book written out telling you how to lead your life or telling you which way to lead your career. Or, and if you do, please let me publish it. I will, I will pay good money for it. But nobody knows what they're doing. Going back to the Dreamforce, Dan Levy keynote, nobody knows what they're doing. And algorithms are kind of dumb because nobody knows what they're doing. We're not going to figure it out. That's impossible, right? So just have fun with it and don't be intimidated by it. And by the way, the, the meme I have over here is from Mrs. Davis. It's about a nun who's fighting AI. If you haven't watched it, highly, highly recommend it. Everybody on this call will love it. And whether you're watching it or you're a panelist on this call, you're, you're going to love that show. So it's very funny and very spot on in a lot of ways. And Buffalo... Wild Wings, that's all I gotta say. If you've watched it, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so before we can um, get an insight into what's coming in the future, I am obligated to share this forward-looking statement asking you to make your purchasing decisions on based on what's available today. So with that out of the way, um, Marketing GPT um, was announced at Salesforce Connections in Chicago this June. But what exactly is it? Well, Marketing GPT is the first GPT-powered marketing platform that's built on uh, the world's most trusted CRM, that's Sales Cloud. So Salesforce is reimagining Marketing Cloud with generative AI capabilities that will transform the way you interact with your marketing systems and allow you to fuel creativity with data-driven answers. So you'll be able to use your trusted customer data to inform things like campaign strategy and audiences and content. 
you'll also be able to unlock efficiency with GPT enabled campaigns, which can save you countless hours um, on every single step of the campaign lifecycle. And thirdly, um, uh, GPT redefined the limits of personalization at scale. So with a combination of GPT content creation and predictive AI recommendations. And, and all of this is actually a lot closer than you might realize. So uh, segment creation was uh, uh, announced and launched at, um, at Connections and it's uh, currently in pilot. So um, this helps you build uh, segments in data cloud very fast using natural language prompts. Next, we have email content creation. So this is going to in pilot um, just a month away in this October. So you'll be able to ask Einstein GPT to create personalized email subject lines and body copy variants to choose from or improve on. And then there's the typeface partnership, which is announced a connection. So this uses generative AI to create and access contextual visual assets, that is images for multi-channel campaigns. So before we get into the demo, I think it's important to understand how Einstein GPT grounding works. So the way grounding works is that you start with a prompt and then you, bring, then you ground um, this prompt with trusted data from your CRM. And this brings an imported data stored in data cloud while also ensuring data security and privacy. And then uh, when large language models or LLMs are, are run, um, only enough information is used to make a decision um, and this, this is shared, then it disappears. It's not stored anywhere in any external systems. Your data isn't mixed with public data. It only uses your data. And finally, the generated content now is more accurate and personalized because of this uh, grounding and using your customer data. So let's take a look at how Einstein GPT grounding makes a difference. So we've started with this prompt of Help me write a catchy email to advertise Connections 2023. So now let's take a look at the result with no grounding. Um, and so this says, Dear Sam, Connections 2023, the essential part Salesforce event for marketers is just around the corner. Seats are going fast. You can read the rest. Now let's take a look at the result grounded with CRM data. So uh, as Robin uh, hinted earlier, it, um, it transforms the conversation and narrative. So I, it says, I'm thrilled to invite you back to Connections 2023. Seats are going fast, but as a valued marketing cloud customer, we've saved four seats for you and your colleagues. So both of these emails have been generated by GPT, but as you can see, the version that's been grounded with CRM data on the right, um, like the fact that they've attended Connections, um, have been added to the email. So that's how uh, Einstein GPT, uh, grounding GPT works and, um, and how it makes the results more accurate and personalized. So now let's go and see it in action. And I think it's important to stress that this is a forward looking or future looking visionary demo um, that gets you, um, gives you an idea of the direction that uh, Salesforce are thinking and heading. So as we all know, marketers are on the hook to deliver growth with greater efficiency. Fortunately, our marketer uh, for, of the future here at Northern Trail Outfitters, um, she can just ask Einstein GPT to recommend what products she should promote to maximize revenue from available inventory. And Einstein GPT will use Northern Trail Outfitters trust, trusted customer data to, to make a recommendation. So here it looks like footwear is the answer. She can now ask Einstein GPT to help her create a campaign to turn this insight into action. But first things first, behind any good marketing campaign is a data-driven brief. And that's exactly what Einstein GPT has generated here. Using the conversation from Slack is the starting point for the prompt. And it's all interactive and fully editable, as you can see here. After the brief has been generated, she sees that Einstein GPT has automatically drafted a full campaign based on the information in that brief. What makes this unique is that the campaign is grounded with her trusted customer data and data cloud. This means her answers are accurate, her data is secure, and there'll be no hallucinations for Einstein. 
All right, so let's dig into this and starting with the audience segment. After reviewing the filters for the segment, our marketer decides she wants a slightly broader audience. So she asks for additional activities to be included. And Einstein GPT translates her natural language into the appropriate segment attributes. But marketers tell us that their biggest challenge is actually creating content for personalization. But thankfully, Einstein GPT is one step ahead and has already crafted a draft email for review. Looking at the content, look, it's on the right track, um, but she thinks the copy could be a little bit more exciting. That's better, but I don't know, maybe a bit long. So she asks to go and make it shorter. Perfect. Now that she's happy with a copy, she turns her attention to the images, which could also be a bit more exciting. And that's where the new partnership with typeface comes in. Using the same chat that she is going on with Einstein GPT, she can ask to add a nature background to the product recommendation block. And Typeface will generate multiple image recommendations based on uh, NTO's brand content and guidelines. The marketer then selects the images she likes best and saves the email. But we're not done yet. So Einstein GPT has already taken care of activation um, and created a cross-channel journey, all based on details from the campaign brief that she started with, like to promote their loyalty program. The journey looks good, so she hits save and activate. So with a marketer in the loop at every step, Einstein GPT has helped her create this campaign faster than ever. And that's really a taste of what's to come with marketing GPT. And as I mentioned, some of these features are currently in pilot or will be piloting soon. So I have a question um, regarding some of, some of the new tools that are coming out. Um, you know, obviously we work with clients and it's kind of sometimes really hard to get through the red tape. Like, are there suggestions of how we should approach legal with this? Because even just, I think, typing into chat GBT could be an issue for some. I guess I could talk quickly from, from Salesforce's point of view. Um, part of what our attempt is to reduce that, that risk and that, um, I guess the, the blockage to adoption is to uh, really nail down that security piece and, and trying to ensure that there's no data from your systems leaving your ecosystem and being used in anybody else's business. That's sort of as much as we can do from our end to, to help with that adoption and help that trust is, is to give you that um, certainty. Um, and uh, beyond that, obviously your own risk appetite as a business has to come into to effect, right? Every, every individual business is going to have its own risk appetite for generative AI and whether or not it um, needs certain checks and balances before things are allowed to be used in any sort of customer facing context, especially when it comes to marketing and, and trying to automate um, copy, there's a massive risk that we obviously can um, automate too much and have messages going out to people that don't represent our voice or our brand. And so, you know, we, we talk a lot about human in the loop AI, where even in the, the most automated um, cases, at least for that foreseeable future, that next five to 10 years we've been discussing today where you know this technology is still in flux and, and we, we still see these huge biases and problems. We, we really still do need a, a human behind the wheel um, to make those, those last executive decisions to say, this is our voice, this is our brand, this copy fits, and we're happy to use it for this context. And I think that, that piece will still exist for, for quite some time. Okay. That's awesome. Um, quick question on copywriting. So is there like a copywriting checkpoint so that we don't incur copyright infringement with some of the AI generated um, content? So some of, sorry, sorry. you're mad. No, no, I was gonna, I was just gonna go ahead. No, you go, Robin. Sure. I was gonna say that is a really good question. And, <laughs> but, I, uh, but I guess that the, the rules that we've got now apply We've, we've heard 
said a few times, um, AI is a tool or the chat chat's right. a tool. We, we're going to have to keep applying the same rules that we have in the past. But I guess you're asking, can that be automated? Is that correct? Yeah, just because like us, uh, one of my got infringement from, you know, was using just repurposed content. And so now it's down to the images and, and copy. They're a pretty great, good company. So um, I was just wondering if there was a checkpoint in there, but you know, maybe that's something that is added on later. I think I could like, we don't have a specific point of view from a product lens, um, but I, I talk right. to things like auto GPT and these other solutions where they're using a GPT agent to validate the output of another GPT agent, where you have the ability to have something check over your generation. That's also not human. So it's, it's only job would be to, to validate the originality of, of your, your copy, those kind of, flows are definitely something I see becoming more prevalent where, you know, we're trusting AI to give us that first look over of our copy, that first check of our copy. So we, we have a good idea of, of whether or not it, it's good before it gets to a human. It's just that last mile check. Um, but we, right. we've seen a massive increase in um, copyright tools for AI, right? With um, Turn Me In, for example, um, being almost mandatory now for even local high schools who who need to validate that their students, even as old as 13 years old, are, are using original content and not just plagiarizing an, an AI model. Um, so that, right. that particular field, I think, is going to continue to develop and, and we're going to continue to see leaps and bounds in, in that space. Awesome. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, I think we're gonna to have to wrap because we are well over time. Uh, thank you so much for everyone that's contributed. Uh, we, we've had about 50 people on the call um, and it's just great to be able to share this. We will get the recording out just as soon as we can in the next 24 hours. Looking forward to um, looking forward to learning more about what everyone's doing with ChatGPT um, and with AI and um, with this foundation, new foundation we've got. Thank you.